morning. Um, and um, thank you for inviting me for the second time. I'm honored to be here and to share with you with some of my thoughts uh, and results. Uh, maybe first I will introduce myself a little bit. I, 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 I could say I am a scientist, the period, or I am a practitioner, period. I am a sort of a mixture. So the first one is, I think, the most important part of me, the, the first hat on my head is practice, uh, especially last over 20 years with Ashoka Innovators for the Public, which is uh, well represented here. Uh, and uh, what I'm doing now, I'm being a uh, second opinion reviewer, traveling around the world and interviewing candidates to Ashoka. Um, yes, I just came back from Johannesburg before I was in Venezuela, Senegal, and so on. So I'm loaded meeting with, uh, by meeting with those exceptional social innovators. And I think this is the core. When I come back home from such a visit, I am telling my family, listen, I." I interviewed such a guy who is making such a wonderful social change. They are looking at me skeptically and saying, what, the world is falling apart and you are so optimistic, but I am. <laughs> and uh, at some point I found many communalities between uh, all those people I meet. I make over 100 interviews with um, candidates to Ashok around the world. And I found that the, they share something, that this is important to find out what, to do some research. And this is the reason why I joined the university, made my PhD in identifying the commonalities of social entrepreneurs, and then went into more broader scope, which is what makes social change durable and irreversible and um, interviewed, for example, the Basque country activists, what contributed to, how civil society contributed to the peace process in the Basque country, or studied the Polish Solidarity Underground Movement and compared it with the civil rights movement in the US, what contributed to the power of this movement, to the durability of the effects of those movements, and so on. And, um, Empathy is one of the topics which I am interested in. In my researches, I published an article, Empathy as a Mirror Neurons and Sync, a couple of years ago. And this brings me to the third hat on my head. Whatever I do, I am turning it in the back of my mind into a, something written down. And I just want to write down things, not necessarily only in a very uh, academic style, like the many articles I publish, but also for a broader public. So I published several books. Um, one is on social entrepreneurship with my partner, Andre Novak, and the new one, the last one, which appeared a month ago by Cambridge University Press in the, is the Empowering Leadership of Tomorrow. And this book actually covers some of the issues I'm going to talk about today. And this is you know, moving in circles. Uh, this is a circle and this is a circle. Actually, I, I think my, I, I, when I look at myself, I see myself being in sort of circles. So the, Circle I'm going to talk about today is uh, start with serendipity, which is uh, the propensity for generate, generation, uh, generating new ideas. Then uh, it is bounded with creativity, of course. How horizontal networks and random encounters contribute to serendipity, and um, how joy and unexpected inspiration, and then dance and brain plasticity all contributes to creativity, and then how it boosts serendipity, and how that, all that is uh, connected and interrelated and mutually reinforces itself with empathy. Um, and everybody wants to be our babies and our children and our, our adults uh, to be creative, to, to, to 
create new ideas, like my social entrepreneurs, Ashoka Fellows, who bubble with new ideas. And everybody wants that, Every talk, everybody talks about it, but actually people don't know how to boost it. Is it possible and how to do it? And this is one of the issues I want to cover here. So we'll start with serendipity, horizontal connections, and random encounters, how they mutually reinforce each other. Serendipity um, is about unexpected innovations. And you have so many in human history, like Fleming, uh, by chance, invented penicillin and Percy. Uh, Spencer unintentionally invented microwave and silver, Spence, Spencer Silver working on glues, invented the glue sticking uh, post it notes. And x rays, Teflon, dynamite, dynamite, and Newton's law after the apple fall on his head. All that was accidental. So, um, is it possible actually to boost it? Isn't it an oxymoron? Because if a serendipity is accidental, then planning to boost it is something extremely, on the other extreme, impossible. So we will be juggling with this oxymoron. But first of all, one question. Do you know where this word, how this word serendipity was born, where it comes from? It's a very old Persian tale, fairy tale, hundreds, hundreds of years old about the princess of Serendip. The princess of Serendip were known of having crazy ideas. That's why they were banned and exiled by the father, the king. And the story is about the, the mo most crazy ideas they generated during walking around the region. And someone later said, okay, so Princess of Serendip, maybe this process of generating new ideas should be called serendipity. And that's the root of this word. So how to boost it? It all probably started, probably, I'm not sure, but probably it started with one of the insights from analyzing different, similar, comparable, though having different results, corporations. For instance, American Big Pharma uh, was excellently managed, employing wonderful experts, but the efficiency was speaking down. Uh, by the way, uh, there were researchers showing that experts the more experts in the firm, the lower the, the outcome. Because people are saying, no, I don't need to actually think about it because they hired those well-paid experts like that they do. And uh, they, the, on the other end, there was a French uh, firm, Paris Juchy. In the same period of time, both were pharmaceutical which were the efficiency and inventions were skyrocketing. So the, uh, they wanted to analyze what was the core difference. They found that the core difference is that was that the American corporation had those wonderful charts with arrows, who is the deputy of who, and very well structured, and all that killed the process of innovation. Whereas the French film was undergoing retrofitting because they were removing asbestos from the wall, and they just re replaced the staff in small groups in a very random setting. So people who never knew each other before met in a random setting, and they removed them and changed it, and it was in constantly changing while this retrofitting was going on. What happened is that those people meeting uh, uh, unexpectedly uh, inspired each other so much. Listen, tell me about your story. What are you doing? Oh, that really overlaps with my interest, so let's write an article. There were 55,000 articles being published during the same time, and uh, many patents and so on. People were uh, afterwards were examined that they wanted three to five times more 
to cooperate with each, with each other than those people from American, pharma American. So um, this was one of the first insights that actually encounters, random encounters, uh, can boost creativity and boost serendipity. Um, this is especially an issue at the um, Silicon Valley. They are very interested with how to, how to boost Yahoo, for instance. What happened with Yahoo is in 2013, though, there was this nightmare idea to um, replace everybody to work from home uh, because uh, it costs much less. And then the Yahoo was picking down totally. It's a total disaster. So the new CEO, Marissa Mayer, said, no way, everybody come back, back to the, to the working together. What's more, we are creating a special place in the center of our uh, firm, and this is the place for the coffee machine, and everybody is paid for sitting there doing nothing but just meeting random people, unexpected, uh, and having impromptu discussions and inspiring each other. And then it went up. It was the economists who reported that, saying that spontaneous meetings around the coffee machine are probably the most efficient. <clears throat> now they are, meetings around the coffee machine is a, sort of a catchword in uh, Silicon Valley. So this is um, one of the, the answers for this question, how to boost serendipity, is to create a special milieu. It's not to push people, to train people in serendipity, whatever, that doesn't work because this, this would be an oxymoron, but to, tr to create a special environment where there are horizontal and diagonal connections so that people from different departments, from different level of uh, management can meet together in, around the coffee machine or another way and uh, exchange ideas and inspire each other. So uh, it also has to do with empathy. Remember this circle at the beginning, that empathy is the center of all that. Because if you meet a new person, you need to tune into this, this new world. You need to get into the shoes. You need to uh, be empathetic to the, the, when you meet old buddies from close-knit circles, from the close offices or close, the, the same meetings with the same people each week or each, uh, each day or whatever, you actually are saturated with their ideas. You think it's a routine. You think that there is nothing new they can tell you. So you actually shut down your empathetic sense. Or you, whereas when you meet new people, you, you, you are open. What are you doing? And why? You really? That's your idea? Maybe that will match my idea and we, have, we can work together. And here are some examples. Uh, there is a wonderful Cambridge Innovation, Innovation Center and Venture Cafe, which is a cafeteria where the, their mission is that they believe that innovation is a social process and that the, to connect community and to make a sort of a, a milieu for conversation and for bringing new ideas together, the value added is uh, what they want to do. And one of their clients reported, I, I'll show you photos from that place, reported that I heard the word serendipity here in Boston so many times, lots of meetings by the coffee machine. So it happens. And see how it looks like? Um, people meet, sit, or they work. It's, it's an open space. Um, it's not just work, work, work. Be isolated. Take your coffee from a very well-hidden kitchenette and go so quickly to your box. No, it's a, a drink together, socialize, have fun, have fun will come later. It's not that uh, on, it's not that reshaping the play, uh, space. It's also a new architecture. Can you imagine that the, the, the best of the best architects now are involved with GAFA, GAFA or Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and restructuring the whole buildings and the whole settings 
I will show you some photos. This is all to boost serendipity. It started with the idea that why should we isolate our group, our organization, our business? Maybe we should be together with some other diverse, completely different organizations. So they came to the uh, idea to have a company sharing space with the university, but uh, with a division, with a barrier. But then the next step was to have a common coffee place, and then finally they met stop everybody with everybody, so that people from completely different background, age, level of education, were meeting each other, uh, trying to understand this guy who is so weird, uh, really dressed or ha ha haircut, uh, or, or who is a student, and vice versa, the, the business nerd, they tried to actually uh, get together. And they, there was so many inspiration in those connections. So Frank Gehry, built a Stata Center, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which is an open space. It creates a lot of space for impromptu serendipitous meetings and uh, inspirations. Here is another Brooklyn space for the, this, with this kind of architecture. A St. Louis office, some of them work, some of them socialize. So this is, this is becoming, a, this, we are entering a completely new world of, of, uh, of uh, the working space where, where we can be free, when we can meet with people, inspire and get inspired. And this is something which really is interesting. Can you imagine Google Engineering Hub? Having, you know, for fun, this is how she commutes from the one level to another. They play. They also can stay isolated, relax, charge batteries, or even ch close them and be alone for a while because sometimes people need to disconnect and focus. So, it costs millions of dollars, but they are not doing it just for philanthropy because they want to make those people, their employees happy. They are making it for money because it gives an immense return in the staff's creativity, loyalty, cooperation. Now we were talking about sync and synchronizing. Um, it, people can't synchronize or things or animals or whoever with a top-down process, with a very well-managed organization with those boxes and arrows. Impossible. Synchronization can happen only bottom-up, when people are free. Let's uh, look at, uh, for instance, V-shaped flock of birds. This is the emergent phenomena out of a group of completely chaotic birds who make a lot of noise, sit on a tree, and suddenly, in a second, they form this wonderful uh, symmetric, V-shaped flock of birds. It's well being uh, studied by um, some scientists, also computer scientists, doing simulations. And what appeared is that they have no leader, those birds. They just exchange information on the gravity and the direction, uh, uh, geographical directions. And through those exchange, from chaotic exchange between those birds, they suddenly create this wonderful new emergent phenomenon, which is actually at some point I ruined my, my wife's vacations. May she rest in peace. 
So whenever we were walking, I was see emergent phenomenon, emergent. And she was pissed off with that emergent phenomenon. <laughs> see those puppies. Only if they are free. If that would be managed top down, if someone or, or even mother dog would try to organize them, they will never reach this wonderful harmony, synchrony, the minimum of energy being spent and so on. This is only freedom of interaction which enables them. What do we need more? Give them space, make them happy, let them play and synchronize. See? Now, this is important. Imagine, or try to visualize those people here. One is extrovert, another is introvert. One is, being, is in love, and the second one is being abandoned by fiancé. Uh, one is hungry, another is diabetic. They are completely different. They have completely different internal individual frequency. So one tends to clap fast, oh, I want to eat, I want to eat. Another one slowly depressed, was abandoned by fiancé. But when they are together, they grasp the rib from each other, and they perform it in a perfect, scrutinized way. Now, this is the, we call it the emergent phenomenon. Um, now, imagine someone trying to organize this top down. Now, you three clap together, you organize, the boss has deputies, each deputy has five person. That would take weeks. Whereas here, it's instant. So again, there is something in giving people, animals, people, I also have a slide somewhere of metronomes synchronizing together. So it's not only living, but also. There is a tendency to be empathetic, to sense what the neighbor, what his, the neighbor's rhythm, and to adjust my rhythm to the neighbor. The natural tendency to be empathetic with the neighbors, with another baby, with the, with the puppies, with other puppies. Uh, so we don't need to over-organize everything, just give space. Another thing is that there is a lot of joy uh, related to unexpected uh, inspirations. And the joy is an extremely important factor in, uh, in empathy and boosting serendipity, creativity. Without joy, actually, this all would be down, depressed. And I, I, I don't think that you could convey empathy in an unjoyful environment. Let's, we'll come to that a bit later. So, um, the, the, I don't know how much you are aware that there was a very well-known in social, sociology um, uh, article, Granovetter's finding, he called it the strength of weak ties. It was decades ago when he found out that the real power is not in close-knit circles, when you know everybody, when all the resources are saturated, you have 
gotten all you could from this close-knit circle. The real inspiration comes, and they call it the networks, um, theory, uh, strong, small worlds. The real inspiration comes in weak ties. When someone from a close-knit, one's close-knit circle connects with someone else from a distant, completely place, a circle, and they create a tie which actually connects all those five with all those five, which is 25 connections. And those weak ties are the ties which come up uh, during those meetings over the coffee machine. There is a joy of inspiration. When you look at people listening to each other's findings, no, today or yesterday we listened to Christiane, and today, the, today's lecture, we were so inspired and we smiled because it's, it's wonderful to, to, to me. There is a joy that something new comes up and matches and it's, harmon it's in harmony with my thinking and maybe all to, together we can create a value added. Um, so um, there are findings and there are um, theories uh, showing that joy relates positively to creativity in organization. And this is a simple linear uh, dependency. And that very uh, durable, long-term, longitudinal Analysis confirmed that positive affect, being positively, uh, having positive attitude, is a predecessor of creative thought. So there is something about joy which makes, uh, which turns our attention to what happens actually with our offices. Are they joyful? Uh, people are happy in our, or no, oh, everybody's working in all box and trying to not to meet anybody else for, for long. Um, and there is a, a lot of findings that joy relates to creativity. Even few minutes comedy, like there was a research with 60 something subjects they showed to some uh, comedies, to some neutral films, to some sad films. And they found out that only the, the, the positive impulse of positive films, or even by receiving a small bag of candy, improved per performance on, on tasks which require creativity, creative thinking. So joy plays a huge role. So just coming back from theory to real life. Uh, does it work in real life? Yes. I recommend very highly this book. Dennis Bakker is a founder, co-founder actually of AES, Worldwide Fund Fortune 200 company, an energy giant of 40,000 employees in 31 countries and so on, 8.6 billion uh, annual income. And uh, he founded this company writing uh, with his friend, co-founder, and being young and thinking about the role of joy and well, maybe, listen, maybe we will found a company which is based on joy. They, they didn't even know that this will be an energy giant, just a company based on joy. And they said that the ethos of this company should be let's have fun, that's it. And out of this, they, they and, and, and Baca actually writes in his book that he rejects workplace plodding uh, as a toxic remnant of the industrial revolution. He believes work should be fun. And, and what that happens at a yes uh, company. So he says that uh, the joy uh, where he wants every person from custodian to CEO having the power to use the t her or his talents and uh, absolutely with no need of the corporate bureaucracy. We'll hear more examples of this kind, for instance, there is a fascinating story of uh, Morningstar, how it started. It started in 1990 with, with a group of people who made already commitments for a huge tomato processing 
fr uh, factory, and uh, they had a deadline of March to put up the first building because the machinery was already contracted and landing from Italy, and the tomatoes were about to be coming on in March to to start the processing uh, process. But it was completely, it was, uh, so, there was so much time, so little time that uh, this pro program was actually, actually very near to collapse. They, uh, they were all working day and night, seven days a week, but still they couldn't make it. They were well organized in divisions with boss and deputy boss and so on. And here comes the, their um, chief CEO, Chris Rufer, at that time a student and an op operator of one of the trucks. And he said, okay, we are endangered. We are about to collapse. So let's try this one. I am proposing two rules and only two rules. Everything else goes out. First, that people shouldn't use force or violence against each other, verbal or nonverbal. And second, people should honor the commitments they make to the others, not to the boss, to the others. So it is a peer-to-peer -peer process. And these two principles gave them so much hope, energy, identification with the program, co-responsibility that, act, that actually they finalized and the production move, um, started uh, as it had to in July 1990. And what happens is it's now one of the biggest uh, tomato processing corporations in the world, covering 40% of uh, the U.S. market and so on with 700 million in annual revenue. But they still use those principles and only those principles. No human bosses. You only negotiate with your peers and you report your per annual performance to your peers. You can purchase whatever you want. You can travel wherever you want for the company. We trust you. There are no titles, no promotion, and the compensation are this, uh, based on the peer, peer process, evaluation process. Um, and what happens is that they internalize so much the mission. Their loyalty is much higher, and much, much better, which yields much better performance. There were some interviews, and, one, and some of them said that they can't wait over the weekend for the Monday to come so that they can play again the tomato game. They call work a game. It is a tomato game. They are missing over the weekend. So creativity is intelligence having fun. This is what Albert Einstein said. And, um, in, indeed, play and enjoy augments creativity. Uh, there are so many in, uh, already evidence and researches that it for, play and enjoy fosters new neuronal connections. Uh, we'll talk about that later. It's sort of a boosting plasticity, neuroplasticity of the brain. And especially in frontal lobes, the part of the brain responsible for higher mental fu function. And uh, it also was documented that play facilitates divergent thinking abilities. Divergent thinking is the core of creativity. It's uh, connecting completely unrelated and distant things in one innovative solution. This is divergent thinking. Let me give you an example. I was um, interviewing someone in, in Africa who was a teacher of physics who complained a lot that there is no interest in physics whatsoever among the students. On the other hand, he complained that the streets are polluted with Coke cans, soda cans. And the third thing is that there is no electricity and the households have no way to warm water. Three completely the, uh, unrelated issues. What he did, he organized competitions for kids to collect cans and make concave mirrors out of those cans. 
so that they gather the x-ray and they heat the, the water. And then the competition is which is more efficient, but everybody wins, everybody gets a, gets a reward. It's on media, everybody hears about this idea, and then the students got interested in physics, how the x-rays actually gather in one point. The streets are clean because they are collecting the cans, and households get a device for warming water. So, Connect, divergent thinking is connecting completely unexpected issues. And um, to do that, to boost this divergent thinking, you need a neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is at decreasing over li our lifetime because we are using old patterns and we are, don't need actually to, to learn anything more. We don't need new neural connections because neuroplasticity could be seen as establishing new neuronal connections. The more we are mature, the more we know, the more we store in our brain patterns, we use those patterns, which is good because we don't need to explore, but it's also bad because we are not so eager, not so prompt to, to have our neurons connect. Uh, there, there are three actually kinds of, of neuroplasticity, functional one, and this is the best known when there is a brain damage for some reason. They use the, some rehab ways to, to stimulate um, alternative pathways of neuronal connection. But the new discoveries are that there is also a lot to do with, uh, to, to do with synaptic plasticity, which is the connections between the, the neurons and to boost those connections. And also neurogenesis plasticity, when stem cells reproduce fully function in brain cells. So nobody before uh, 20 years ago believed that there is, an, there is a chance for the brain to, to produce um, brain cells. We thought, people thought that damage is damage, that's it. But now we know that through neuroplasticity, we can stimulate that. And how, and here are my hypotheses, my conjectures, that um, neurons don't usually connect directly. The axons, which is the initiator, and the dendrites of the other neuron, which is the re receiver, connect to neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters are sort of neurohormones. They are, let's say, dopamine, which is a pleasure hormone. Endorphin, which is, happy, is a happiness hormone. Actually, endorphin is from endogenous morphine. So this is a small portion of internal morphine we inject, auto-inject, and get a kick of euphoria. And others. But focusing on those two, when a dopamine and endorphin becomes neuroconnectors, neurotransmitters, and when they are produced in a higher volume, then we not only connect our neurons for better plasticity, neuroplasticity, but also get a kick of joy. So my actual conjecture and this is something which I want to follow up with some research, is that there is a sort of a circle, that dopamine and endorphin, they stimulate joy. Joy enhances creativity, and creativity uh, actually stimulates new neuronal connections, which is through dopamine and endorphin. And in some cases, this is a sort of a mutually reinforcing process, especially visible with, in, with creative people. For instance, this is a wonderful book by, written by Chinson Mihaly, a professor of psychology who interviewed the best creative people in the world and found that uh, creativity is fun for them. Their reports, everybody reported that the process of being creative, the bubble of new idea, delivers such a joy and happiness that some of them compare it to sex. Even. And also, fun augments creativity. Um, Peter Saints, one of the um, gurus in 
business consultancies, the author of Fifth Discipline. He wrote a book, The Dance of Change. Dance, fun, augments creativity. And um, I don't know how much time they have. How much? 20 minutes. So maybe I would quickly show you. I use it sometimes in, when I do some business consultancy or work with families. I was a shrink that you can use dance always. You can translate every problem, everything into choreography, into dance. And there was one of many, many cases. They complained that the boss, that, uh, there is a young deputy boss who has, is, uh, acts on behalf of the staff and presents to the boss, the main CEO, new ideas, staff's ideas. The boss then listens, listens and goes to his very old secretary for, for some consultancy and the secretary usually is conservative, says no. And all the new ideas are blocked and they discussed and that was, they were stuck. I told him, okay, there, there's no way, you tried everything. Would you try a very weird idea of dancing your problem? Yes, okay. Let's dance your problem. Here comes the boss. Someone plays the boss. So uh, the main, the, the deputy boss. So the deputy boss comes to the boss with a new idea, yes? And I try to translate it into a movement. Then the, what the boss does, he listens to the idea, but turns it into the secretary and then turns back like that. And the secretary's movement is like that. So the three persons playing their roles start. The deputy boss starts. Start, 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 the boss starts like that, then the thing. No! And clapping, everybody clapping, and they dance really with music and have fun, everybody laughs. And now they say, yeah, it's so easy. It, enables looking at the problem from, from outside the box. It detaches them from, the, from this, this heavy, terrible place where they were stuck. And fun augments their creativity. Yes, we can do that, we can do that. Immediately, instantly. And uh, we talked, uh, we heard from Christiana so many times about the uh, the, um, the baby and the relationship, but what is worth adding is that this is also joy. Without joy, the smile wouldn't be given back and forth. The, pair, the baby wouldn't actually re uh, return the smile to the parents if that wouldn't be joyful. So what, what I think is that the, um, the real function of joy and the, the real uh, success of having this, establishing this empathetic relationship is when the parent is happy, smiling in, with real happiness and that's reacted by the child. When you are, you know, a little uh, concerned with some business problems and you smile like that, and uh, then that doesn't work. So, Joy is an empathy carrier as well. Uh, there were several researches on that. So, um, I don't want here to, to present only researches because it, it, uh, we, it, we would be totally overwhelmed. But um, for instance, the problem was that white teachers don't perform well with, uh, when they work with, in schools and in inner cities with uh, ethnical minorities especially. So there was a research, what contributes to best, better results when white, predominantly white teachers teach predominantly non-white kids. And what was the result? That teachers who, the empathetic joy of teachers is a predictor of much better students' outcome. That's enough. Joy, empathy and joy, not <laughs> Even the best for, uh, IQ doesn't work. Uh, best experience in best schools doesn't work. Just empathetic joy. So this is also dance. Dance which uh, augments brain plasticity. 
the Brent loves music, that, that's what we heard, and uh, dance also integrates and activates diverse parts of the brain. We used to, to dance a lot with our, my wife. May she rest in peace, she passed away some time ago. But when we dance, we try to follow. She tried to follow my movement, I tried to follow her. That was a constant process of getting tuned to, both on a kinesthetic level, but also on an emotional level, and just trying to care for the other person, and so on, and me, for example, not to step on her shoes. And so this is a very diverse exchange, stimulating the brain. And uh, frequent dancing uh, reduces the risk of dementia. We'll come back to it in 76%. I mean, couples who dance frequently, uh, who are aging, are much healthier and live longer. And then there were researchers also which showed that even observing dance, someone who is disabled on a wheelchair doesn't, is not excluded because if, if this person observes dance, and the dance resonates in their early, then also the same result of brain plasticity. So, uh, the, this is a situation, a unique situation of exchange of ideas, feelings, experiences, uh, movements, uh, care for each other, empathy. So the dance, and also it boosts in, a, in many situations creativity. Yeah, here is the research which showed that even, even observing dancing uh, gives a result. This is um, just a review of researches showing that the, the, there are several uh, indicators that the brain function increases, that the dancing increases the brain function. Dancers appear to be more empathetic and sense, emotionally sensitive than the rest of us. There was a research comparing dancers on the empathy scale with, the, with other people. So there is a special role of dance. And that, does it work in, in reality? Yes. For instance, there is a wonderful project, dan Dancing Classrooms, they introduced dance lessons in uh, classrooms, fifth graders, in the inner cities, in the disadvantaged areas, with high-risk communities, and they got fabulous results. This is, for instance, a photo from, West, from Los Angeles, a very violent neighborhood. So I uh, encourage you to go to this, if there is someone from Ashoka, maybe we should consider uh, people from this organization as candidates. Uh, as I said, dance also, pre dancing prevents, uh, prevents many aspects. For instance, they compared the role of frequent reading, crosswords, puzzles, dancing, bicycling, and playing golf and swimming. And it occurred that dancing frequently reduces in 76% the risk of dementia compared to 47 crosswords and 35 frequent reading. Also Parkinson's disease. There, there are researches that people <laughs> with Parkinson's disease, when they dance, they actually develop, develop their, um, their divergent thinking and uh, the, the way the, the theory explains it is that they open the new pathways for dopamine depleted blockages. So the dopamine is open to circulate. And I think that these findings are only a first step. <clears throat> and first step in, in creating a completely new environment for our work, for our <clears throat> relationship. Um, <clears throat> could we try to predict how it will look like in the future? Actually, Samuel God Goldwyn said that never make predictions, especially when they relate to the future. But I, I will try to 
So the corporation of the future, coffee machine is located centrally with people meeting randomly there, having comfy seats and being paid for chatting, not for hard working in boxes. Large spaces are being created to meet with others. Small boxes are banned. There is a joy of work, removal of bureaucracy and plotting. There are a lot of horizontal and diagonal connections. There is an empowerment of bottom-up initiatives. That's the only way to synchronize, remember, from bottom-up. Role-playing when encountering problems. For instance, you don't, if you sit and confront with a problem, you actually get stuck very quickly. But when you try to role play or dance the problem, as I showed you, it shows some new perspectives. You can look at it from outside the box. Um, also, there were some consultancies with business teams who were very much stuck to step away and write haiku poems. Everybody writes a poem, haiku, short haiku poem, and then everybody reads that. The poems are supposed not to relate to the situation, but to trees, weather. And then afterwards, we are looking at it from a different perspective, and it also helps. And then dancing in various settings in small and large groups. Now, we have seen Bacchus' joy at work. We have seen Morningstar. Are there other examples? Yes. For instance, I participated at some point with ISEC Students Organization, very big one, operates since 48, currently 136 countries. They organize a lot of conferences where they meet people from various countries and make them inspire each other, exchange. They have evenings with national foods, exchange of those national foods. So this is also a wonderful organization fostering inter-exchange across borders, religions, and so on. So they always start the conference with dancing. I was totally stunned the first time I was there. They party till late of the night. They are absolutely on time. They gather on the stage and they dance. First, we would really, most of them stand and dance. Then they sit down and they work very efficiently. And then I've seen that for several times. It's amazing how much spirit it gives them. Um, and there are other organizations. There is um, SEMCO in Brazil. Um, and SEMCO's uh, founder, Ricardo Semler, I'm connected with him because I write a book on him and others and on Mary Gordon. Um, he says work is a, should be a way to enjoy life. Future, future managers should be, enable employees to blend work life and personal life with enthusiasm and creativity, creative energy, and so on. Another one is the Goretex, the Bill Gore, Gore Associates, the Goretex production. This is a huge firm. And Bill Gore says, our organization is very trust-based with a lower turnover rate compared to other organizations on the market. Because having fun is, a, is a, at least as valuable as making money. That's what he says, and that's what the mission and the objectives of Gartex are. And they are both huge organization. It's not a small one, a startup. It's 35 million uh, and 94 and 212 in 2002, Semco, and, and um, 3 billion in, in dollars annual revenue in, in Bill Gore organization. And they operate with joy. Joy is the core. So this is, I think, this is the future. Really, I believe that. And the last comment is that one part we are hearing and we are sometimes fascinated is the technology, computerization, augmented reality, virtual reality, internet of things, artificial intelligence, robotics, and so on. And this is all detaching us from the humane side of 
our work, of our connectivity. So I think this is dump and dump empathy. Where is the other, other part? Is the one which we have seen here. It's make, making people more identified and loyal with the, with the organization. It's the harmony of synchronizing bottom-up meetings, tendencies, ideas. Uh, it's the serendipity which is much higher. These are the humane relationships and that is much, much better economic results. So this is something I believe in, I wanted to share with you, and I wanted to thank you.